We've all been to the circus, and one of the acts that you regularly see in the circus is the high wire act. This is where a person is walking on a wire from one place to another. They have a pole in their hand because they know in order to walk straight, things have got to be balanced. The wire is so thin that if they lean too far to one side or the other, disaster awaits. Because if they fall, it's cataclysmic. And so, in their walking to try to make sure that they, they don't tilt too far to the left or the right, they hold in their hand this bar to pull them back to balance when one side or the other in their own movement is in jeopardy. We're living in a world out of balance. People are tilting to one side or another. They're tilting to cultural sides. They're tilting to racial sides. They're tilting to political sides. They're tilting to gender sides. They are, they're tilting and we're watching the disaster of lack of balance. So that people are not able to live their lives in a straight line because they're being pulled to one side or the other and their equilibrium becomes challenged. Christians face this challenge of balance as well. On one side, they're Christians who are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. They will talk about the glories of the life to come while experiencing disaster in the life that is. On the other hand, there are those Christians who are so earthly minded that they are no heavenly good. They become so secularized, they become so culturalized, they become so worldly that heaven has no use for them. When the balanced perspective is to be so heavenly minded that you bring good to earth because you're operating from eternity, translating it back into time. The question that I would like to speak to today is this issue of balance. Because we're all being pulled on all kinds of levels with all kinds of forces trying to pull us and get us off of our walk so that we, we keep our balance in life. God capsulizes this concept of balance in one verse, a very well-known verse in Scripture. And in light of what's happening in our lives and what's happening in our society today, I thought it would be helpful for you and me to understand how we are to have this life of biblically-based balance. And I call it the divine imperative. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Let me read it again. And he has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah is a book of complaint. In theology, we call it a covenantal lawsuit. 
where God makes his formal legal complaint against his people. His people were playing church and trying to bribe God with religion. That's why he leads up to these verses, summarized in verse 6 and 7, with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearly yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What shall I give God that's going to satisfy him? That's when he comes with verse 8. This is what God is asking for. You ever have anybody in your life who gives you what you don't ask for? You, you ever order something and they bring something else? That's not what I ordered. They can't just say, well, at least you get to eat. Because that's not what you ordered. At least you don't have to leave hungry. But that's not what I asked for. They were giving God religion, church attendance, even tithes. They were giving God, they, they were giving God religiosity without giving him what he asked for. He says, this is what the Lord requires, demands. Therefore, it's an imperative. An imperative is not a request. <laughs> an imperative is a demand. This is what I want from you. Give me this and I can accept your religion. Give me this and I can receive your tithes. Give me this and I can embrace your worship. But do all of that and don't give me this. Then I leave hungry. Because you didn't give me what I asked for. And he asked for three things. And this is a summary of the whole Bible in a sense. But these are the three things he wants from you and me as a prerequisite to worship he can receive. And so I want to go over these three things with you today. And if we can embrace them in our lives, our families, our churches, and in our society, then we can see God show up. We refuse them, and you'll just carry on with religion as usual without seeing the God that you had religion about show up. First of all, he says, I want you to do justice. The first thing in this balance is I want you to do justice. Please notice, justice is something you do. It's not merely something you discuss. It's more than having a commission. It's more than having a workshop or a seminar. It's something you do. But the question is, what is it? And how does it work? The problem of justice, a term that comes up in our society quite a bit, is a question of fairness, of what's fair, what's right. But there's a problem because we don't all view fairness the same way. What I believe is fair to me, you may not believe is fair to you. It's like the, um, it's like the, the mother with four, with four children. She has three pieces of chocolate. She gives one to the first one, one to the second one, one to the third one. But there is none for the fourth one. So the fourth one cries out, Mama, that's not fair. Because that's not equal. You, you, you gave my siblings each a piece of chocolate. You didn't give me a piece of chocolate. I'm left out. That's not fair. Mother then goes to the, the freezer part of the refrigerator and pulls out some ice cream. Mother dips ice cream out to number four. Number one, two, and three <laughs> say that's not fair. That's not fair because all you gave us was chocolate. 
but you gave sibling number four ice cream. So they're arguing preferred treatment. You, you preferred four because you gave four something you didn't give one, two, and three. So that's not fair. Mother gets frustrated because everybody has a complaint about fairness. So she makes them all go outside. Y'all just go outside, getting on my nerves, go outside and play. All four are saying, that's not fair. <laughs> because that's coerced treatment. So you got unequal treatment. The first one didn't get the chocolate. You got preferred treatment because you gave them ice cream and you didn't give us ice cream, you just gave us chocolate. You got, you, you got coerced treatment because you made us do something we didn't want to do. So everybody's got to complain, it ain't fair. And the reason why we have all this calamity in our society today is because people are not always agreeing on what's fair based on their history, their background, their experiences, based on their perspective, how they were raised, and that all affects our view of fairness. But yet God says over and over and over and over and over in the scripture, justice. So what is justice given all of these variables in our lives and in our history and in our economy and in our society, what is fair? Because in our four children, all they did was grow up. And when they grew up, they brought that same question about fairness. Is fairness $15 an hour? Is fairness $12 an hour? Is fairness $25 an hour? What's fair? And so everybody's fighting over fairness. Let me give you the biblical definition. The Greek word for justice means that which is right. It means the prescribed right way. Biblical justice is the equitable and impartial application of the rule of God's moral law in society. Biblical justice is the equitable and impartial application of God's moral law in society. Justice always starts with what God declares a matter to be. Please don't lose sight of James chapter 4 verse 12 which says there is only one law giver and that one law giver by which right and wrong is to be determined is God. Only one law giver the Bible says. So any other rules anybody makes in order for it to be just must be consistent with the one law giver who gives all the rules. Once folk make their own rules and become their own lawgiver, unrooted in the one lawgiver who exists, you will have a chaos and a whole bunch of people saying, not fair. Because they're not, sent, they're not starting with a central base for the law. The moment in your home, everybody makes their own laws, you're going to have chaos in your home because they're going to make a law that is always in their best interest. When you, when you make rules for you, you're looking out for you because people make laws based on their interest. That's why justice has to be impartial. It, it, it can't be tied to, to my own interest. It has to be tied to something that is bigger than just me. God wants to be the one law giver for your life. He wants to be the one law giver for your family. He wants to be the one law giver for your church. And he wants to be the one law giver even for government. 
which is why Romans 13 says that government officials are to be ministers of God based on what God says is good or evil, right and wrong. So even government officials, God says, I'm the one law giver for government. So the moment they start making laws that is not consistent with my laws, then you're going to have chaos in society because folk going to make up their own laws. That's inconsistent with the king, his kingdom, and how he's made history to work. But he says to his people, I want you to do justice. I want you to be equitable and impartial in the application of my laws in history. That's why justice is normally coupled in the Bible with righteousness. You will find the two twins side by side. They are twins. Psalm 89, 14. From his throne comes justice and righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 19. To follow the Lord in righteousness and justice. Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 and 4. Righteousness and justice together. Why? Because you can't be just if you don't know what's right. You can never be just if there is not a right standard by which you're measuring the decision. So the two must always go together. And God is always right, perfectly right, never wrong about any subject matter. Injustice is the refusal to equitably and impartially apply God's moral law in society. We're living in a day of pluralism. Pluralism winds up saying the only absolute is that there are no absolutes. There are no superintending rules. I make my own rules. <laughs> Pluralism in our world today is there can be no common beliefs. It says any idea is as valid as every idea. <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's, it's pluralism. It's, it's everybody gets to, to do their own thing based on their own rules. So you got this social group making up their rules and this social group making up their rules and this social group making up their rules and these rules clash because there is no superintending, overriding, governing guideline to which they all must submit. And so that can come in a whole lot of things, not only in your personal life, but, but in your family. Because if you got teenagers, you got folk making their own rules. You got teenagers, you got folk making their own rules and when they start making their own rules and you the chief lawgiver, <laughs> clash. What happens when a people do that with God as a society, as a race? You got races making their own rules. So this happens all over the place. And folk make their own rules and wonder why there is no peace. Wonder why there is no order. Wonder why there is no harmony. Because everybody making their own rules. He says, but you, I need more than your church attendance. I need more than your religion. I need you to do justice. Because brothers and sisters, justice is the cornerstone to freedom. You cannot have legitimate freedom as it was meant to be without just boundaries. We want fairness in economics. We don't want people to cheat us. We want fairness in relationships. We want fairness. We want fairness. We want fairness. We want fairness. And God says, then you want my standard if you want fairness. And within that standard, I give you flexibility, but you can't just make up your own rules and expect order. He 
He says, I want you to do justice. Justice is what you do. Injustice, which he condemns, he says, when you are unjust over and over again because you illegitimately oppress people, limiting their potential and robbing them of their freedom because of injustice, you're not applying equitably the rules. And that's evil, he says. It would be the job, as I said last time, of the church to be the thermostat for society and society is the thermometer reading the influence of the church. So if the society is thermometer is reading chaos, it's because that's the thermostat set by the church. We are the influencers. We're supposed to bring God's point of view, the conscience of the culture. Our job is not to parrot the society. We're not parakeets. That's the world telling us what to say and we mouthing it. Our job is to deliver to the society what the one lawgiver has to say about any subject. There is no subject that sits out of divine jurisdiction. None. No subject. No category. Because there's only one lawgiver. But when you don't believe there's only one lawgiver, you go to a whole lot of different folk for different laws. You go, you, go in, you go in all these directions. You go to the culture. You go to what your mama said. You go to what your daddy said. You go to what your friends say. You go to what the television said. You go to all these different directions for folk to tell you what to do, whether they agree or disagree with the one lawgiver. The equitable and impartial application of God's moral law in society based on his word, that is the criteria He says, you do justice. But secondly, I want you to love kindness because as you're walking, see, as you're walking on this tightrope, if you're only concerned about justice, you can develop a hard heart. You, you can develop a, a coldness about you. See, if you're only concerned about justice, then, I mean, you're easy to talk about law and order, law and order, law and order, law and order. You, you want to make sure, keep the law, keep the law, keep the law, keep the law. And, and you broke the law, you broke the law, you broke the law. See, because you want, you, want, you, you want to make sure that the, the rule is being kept. You're off balance it's all, it's all, if all you got is, if all you got is uh, justice. So you lean to one side, you're going to fall over. So you got to balance that pole on the tightrope of your walk. He says, I want you to love kindness. The Hebrew word for kindness, hesed, has to do with the compassion of God. The Bible says his loving kindness endures forever. God's got, see, God's got two sides to it. He got, he's not a one-sided guy. He, don't, he doesn't just lean to justice. He balances it with mercy. A parent who's justice-oriented says, what did I tell you to do? When did I tell you to do it? Why are you not obeying me? Do it because I said so. I gave you the rule. Justice. You obey the rule. That's legitimate as long as it's not off balance. He says, I want you to balance justice with loving kindness. 
I want the folk you're applying the rule to to also know you care about them. I I, I want the folk that you are applying the standard to. Yes, apply the standard. But I also want them to know that you have compassion. Not if you want to have a balanced walk on the tightrope of life. Loving kindness has to do with compassion shown in one of two ways. First of all, God's kindness is to be shown to those whom life has not been good to. In Zechariah, just a few pages over chapter 7, Zechariah says in verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus has the Lord of hosts said, Dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor, and do not devise evil in your heart against one another. Don't do that. He says, remove injustice against those who are oppressed, Psalm 82, 1 to 4. What he says is those who are of the downtrodden, the poor, the oppressed. He says, show them mercy. I'm talking about that child whose whose father abandoned him and the mother has to work two jobs. I'm talking about something that that, that they have absolutely no control over. He says, don't don't just say to that person, you ought to get up and tie up your own bootstraps because that's the right thing to do when they don't have boots. He says, reach out with compassion in the name of God without compromising a standard that if you're healthy, you get a job. So mercy is given on one hand to those people who life has hurt and who are not rebelling. They just, that's just the reality of the atmosphere of evil that has affected them. But there's another need for compassion and not justice when you're guilty when you've sinned when you've disobeyed when you've rebelled and you don't want the full weight of justice you you don't want what the law requires when a criminal's in court and he's found guilty you will regularly hear him throw himself on the mercy of the court. You know what he's asking, she's asking for? Don't give me what the law demands I have. I'm I'm asking you. That's why you will often hear the judge refer to whether the person showed remorse or not. Whether he seemed repentant for the crime. Repentance for wrong done that requires a just response opens up the possibility for mercy. Where there is no repentance, you're blocking the possibility for mercy. But where there has been an infraction and justice demands it, God is the one who decides the consequence, but you open yourself up for mercy if there's repentance. But let me tell you how else you open up yourself for mercy. If God looks at your record and shows, sees that you've shown mercy. Luke 6.36 says God will be merciful to the one who's shown mercy. So if you are a justice person, everything's about justice, and it gets to your turn. And trust me, in life it will get to your turn. And it gets to your turn, and you cry out for mercy. And God looks at the record, and he sees you've just been a law and order person. You've just been a justice person. You have shown no mercy. 
you close the door on your own request. Don't get me wrong. Don't give up justice. There is a standard. But don't give up mercy because God has a heart. And so should his people. We don't have to choose between the two. There's a responsible way to have both. Mercy can be easily misused. And I will confess I have on occasion done so. For example, I was pulled over for speeding. The policeman pulled me over for going too fast in this speed zone. And uh, I politely confessed my sins. <laughs> I concurred. Yes, officer, I was, I was speeding. He said, do you know how fast you were going? Yeah, I do. And I know it was too fast, and I, I am guilty. Uh, I would appreciate any mercy you could show me. It's one thing I know, and that's how to talk to police. I, 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 I appreciate any mercy you show me. He says, well, you know what? I, I can see that you really, really um, are sorry for going fast. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to give you a warning. And I gave him thanks for his undeserved mercy because I was guilty. He drives off. I hit my accelerator. I hit my accelerator. <clears throat> 60 seconds later, I get pulled over by another police car. I'm talking about a, a minute, maybe two minutes later, I am pulled over by another police person. But I know how to ask for mercy. So policeman number two gets out of his car, comes over to me. Sir, you know how fast you were going? Yeah, I do, and I'm so sorry. I, I'm, I am so regretful. You know, I would appreciate any mercy you could show me. <laughs> Looks like I'm in a good place with him, except for the fact that the first policeman drives up. <laughs> he pulls up beside the second policeman, looks at me, and just shakes his head. Because I had abused mercy. Now I know why some of y'all are laughing. Mercy and justice have to be balanced like in Matthew 18, 23 to 35. A man was given mercy by the king but he refused to show mercy and he said, now you lock that man up because he wasn't willing to give to somebody else what he was asking from me without compromising justice. In Luke 10, the story of the Good Samaritan, and a lawyer comes and says, well, what's... What, 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 what's the first good, great law? Love your Lord, love your neighbor. He said, but who's my neighbor? He gives him the story of the good Samaritan, that your neighbor is the person whose needs you see, whose compassion you feel, and whose needs you're able to address at some level. And then he says, well, now you go out and do likewise. You go do it. You, you show mercy. Holding on to justice. We must understand both the content and the scope of the gospel. The gospel's content is faith in the finished work of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as a substitute for our sins. God took out his justice on Christ so he could show mercy to us. So God couldn't compromise his justice. Bam! He had to deal with sin. But in dealing with the sin, it opened up the door so he could show the mercy. 
The content of the gospel is the good news of Christ. But the scope of the gospel, he says, is that the poor would hear good news. He said oppressed people would be set free. He said the good news of the gospel is that people's lives become improved when they embrace the gloriousness of the content of Jesus Christ and see God at work through his people, lives become better. People become freer. They become more responsible. All because the good news affects more than heaven. It's designed to change history. So we're not doing a good job of giving how good the news really is. So he says, I want you to show mercy. And then finally, he says, I want you to walk humbly with your God. Okay, now remember now, we on this wire, we on this, we on this wire, we on this, we on this wire. He says, you got justice and mercy working. But while you working justice and mercy, you're also walking. See, because you, you walking. And I want you to walk humbly with your God. To walk with is a term of intimacy and relationship. God doesn't want a religion that doesn't have a relationship tied to it. Because then it's an event. God is after an intimate relationship. You can have a legal relationship without having an intimate one. Just ask the person you're married to. <laughs> there can be a legal relationship on paper and you don't want to be in the same room because you're not walking with. Okay, so let's, let's work with this a little bit. What does it mean to walk humbly with your God? First of all, notice the order of the sentence. It's walk humbly with your God, not ask God to walk with you. You are walking with him, which means you got to know where he's going. You can't walk with him and you go on someplace that he's not going. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? I mean, we got to be in the same, we got to be heading the same way. And a lot of folks are heading where God's heading and wonder why God's not with them. Because you're not going where he's going. Enoch walked with God, the Bible says. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the garden. They were hanging out in his direction. If some of you walk and you have walking partners, why do you have a walking partner? You don't need somebody with you to walk. You walk all by yourself. The reason you have a walking partner is your fellowshipping and movement. Y'all talking about all this stuff. You're talking about politics. You're talking about kids. You're talking about different stuff. Because what you're doing is sharing life in motion. God wants us to share life with him. He wants us to do life with him. The reason why a lot of our prayers are boring even to God. Even to God. We said, we, 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 we start praying and God said, well, here's what he's going to say. Because it never changes. And the reason why it never changes is because we're not doing life with God. Because if we were doing life with God, he'd be hearing about the good, bad, and ugly. He'd be hearing about the, the struggles, the stresses, the sins, the circumstances, the problems with the kids, the problems with the maid, the problems on the job. He'd be hearing the detail. We finish prayers in one minute because it's the same conversation. It's not bringing all of our lives and unveiling them. It's not exposure to him. Walking with God is a matter of faith. By faith, Enoch walked with God. It is believing and trusting that God hears me expose myself to him, good, bad, and ugly. And we are friends. He's my bestie. Did you know it's okay for God to be your bestie? He's your bestie. The reason why we don't hear God talking to us, he's not our bestie. 
<laughs> he's not who we're hanging with. He's not who we, he who we, you know, you know, we, we talking to him while we're driving. We're talking to him, you know, when I, even if I'm in a meeting and you got to sit down and you got to pray in your mind uh, and think God's thoughts because he can read the prayers in the mind because I'm bringing him to bear on all the stuff and he's included in everything and I'm just enjoying his presence. If the only time you meet with God on Sunday and those one minute before grace prayers, he not your bestie. To walk with God, that is a communion term. To be in communion and an agreement without a leash. You ever see the person with a dog not on a leash and the dog just walking by him? I can tell you they have a great relationship. Because he doesn't need a leash. Doesn't have to be drugged to worship. Drug to pray. Drug to Bible study. Why you didn't come today? Why you didn't come on time? Why you leave early? Why you don't give right? Pull. Pull, pull, because there's no relationship. When there's no relationship, you need a leash. You don't have to pull people who are in a relationship to please the God who they're walking with. But while he's your bestie, he doesn't want you to forget he's also your God. You see, it's okay to be friends with your kids. You ought to be friends with your kids to a point. Not to a fault. You see, you ought to be, Jesus says, we are our, he is our friend. We are his friends, Jesus said. And then he said, if you do what I say. So you and your kids ought to be besties. Y'all ought to be hanging out together. Y'all be having fun together. Y'all ought to be. Y'all ought to laugh together. But they need to know their place. You have anybody in your life who don't know their place? Who think just because you're their friend, they can say anything? They can do anything just because you're their friend? Because they don't know their place. God says, "I want you to walk." Humbly, I know your place because I'm still God. So we're going to be bestie, but know your place. To be humble doesn't mean to, to denigrate yourself. To be humble means submitting to divine authority. It means no matter what anybody else says about you, you better be small in your own eyes. No matter what, what news clippings you get, you better be small in your own eyes, recognizing that you have somebody over you. Uh, you ain't all that. You, you ain't all that. Okay? You worth about $6.75? Because when they bury you, you're going back to dirt. A mannequin in the store, a mannequin in the store, a mannequin in the store. That, that's a good looking mannequin. It's all dressed up. It's all prissy and pretty and stuff. But it only got that way because the owner of the store dressed it up. That's all. The owner of the store made it look good. So mannequin, better known as dummy. <laughs> dummy, don't, don't think you are who you are, where you are, how much you have, how you dress, uh, the job you have, the notoriety, where you live, the car you drive. Look, on your best day, you are a blessed dummy. Because the only reason you are what you are and you have what you have and you got what you got is the goodness and grace of God. So walk humbly with your God. Two kids were arguing with their mother who was going to get the first pancake. She was making pancakes. I want the first one. I want the first one. They're arguing back and forth. Mother said, look, kids, Jesus, if, if Jesus were here, he would say, give your brother the pancake. One brother looked at the other and said, you be Jesus.
walk humbly with you, God. In golf, the, the low score wins. In football, the bigger you are, the lower you go. You're a lineman. So the more you've been blessed, the more humble you should be. You know, the more you go up, the more you go down. And that means the higher you go up, the more intentional you should be about going down. Because the higher you go up, the more people will blow you up. The more people will blow you up and try to fill your head so you think you're more than a bag of chips. You know? It's like the colonel. Colonel's on the telephone, and the colonel's on the telephone, and he just got promoted to be colonel, and somebody knocks on the door. And uh, he says, yes, he says, this is Private Jones. He says, uh, the colonel said, well, just a minute, Private. And he, the colonel picks up the phone and pretends he's talking to the president because he's feeling good about his position. Yes, Mr. President. Yes, certainly, Mr. President. I'll be right there to the White House, Mr. President. My, uh, certainly, certainly. Oh, yes, Mr. President. Thank you. Click. Come in, Private. Private comes in. He says, yes, sir, I've just, I've just come. He says, what can I do for you? Well, I've just come to hook up your phone. Your phone is not... See, we like, we like to impress folk 